Hebrews chapter 12. That's right, isn't it? Yes. <coughs> Hebrews 12. And um, should have been Matthew tonight, but he's otherwise engaged, so um, filling his shoes, as it were. And uh, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 tonight, which I will read. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, some great uh, uh, sort of sort of inspirational uh, verses there. So I'm just going to dip right in, really, to begin with, and say, can you see the kind of picture that the writer to the the Hebrews is giving us there of the Christian life? Sometimes the Christian uh, life is called a walk, and we kind of looked at it a little bit on Sunday, uh, walking circumspectly. You know, the Christian life is a walk, but in this case, it's being related to or being portrayed as a a race, and it's it's sort of interesting to me because when I always used to think about these verses and <laughs> talked about the Christian life being a race, I imagined like this kind of sprint, you know. Pfft, Give it all you've got and get to the get to the finish line, like a sort of hundred meters uh, dash. But then um, we're kind of discouraged from holding that view because it says, "Let us run with patience the race that is set before us." So this can't be a sprint. It can't be a dash where it just takes all this energy and you're there. You know, there is patience. Um, involved here and it reminded me a little bit of what James says in James chapter 1 uh, sort of 3 to 4 he says knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing one of Nigel's favourite words there perfect uh so so yeah that perfecting that perfection comes through patience so so this christian life this christian walk or race involves us being patient uh it involves uh us us waiting doesn't it so like like with any race uh the christian life involves fitness stamina Training. I mean, think about an athlete, someone who's taking part maybe in the Olympics or something like that. You know, you don't just kind of put down your McDonald's and say, oh, I think I'll have a go at that. You, you have to go through training, don't you? You have to discipline yourself. It's sort of up uh, as the cock crows and it's early mornings and it's, you know, going out on the cold, sprinting down cold roads and stuff and all that hard road running and stuff like that. I mean, I used to watch things with... Um, I did a bit of um, a bit of Chinese boxing in the past, and used to watch quite a few things on boxing and the training they would do. And it's hard work, you know. It's not easy, you know, when you want to stay in bed and just, you know, they had to get up early. And it's kind of road running, even if it's cold, if it's raining, you still got to do it. And the Christian life does take that kind of discipline, although it's a, a spiritual and a godly discipline. It's the same, you know, up early pray whether you feel like it or not uh, um, taking thoughts captive even when you know you, you, you it seems like too much hassle and and so there has to be this fitness this stamina this training this this determination but also there is this really important element of patience of waiting and of because quite often I don't know about you but but when I've been in situations in the past, I've been a bit impatient with God. You know, it can't happen soon enough for me. If I'm in a, 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 a time of tribulation, 
um, I remember being in a job that um, I really hated and felt stuck in it, totally stuck in it, and uh, thinking, how am I ever going to get out of this job? I'm just praying every day and beseeching God, saying, please get me out of this job, get me a new, another job. I can't take a moment more. And I had to learn patience in that. I had to wait for God until the time was right for God to move me out of it. So it takes all those things, stamina, spiritual fitness, if you like, training, but also it takes this um, element of of patience. And it takes something else as well. It takes a, a laying aside of anything that might hinder uh, hinder us in, in reaching that goal, which is to finish the race. So we've got to look at our lives and say, well, is there anything that is a hindrance, a hindrance to, to holiness? I preached on that subject once. Uh, but anything that is a hindrance to holiness um, must be laid aside in this race. Let's just have a look at uh, First Peter. Uh, first Peter chapter 2 yes chapter 2 and it says um, wherefore sorry verse 1 so first Peter 2 verse 1 <coughs> wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So it's this laying aside, <coughs> laying aside of malice, and so on, laying aside of every uh, uh, weight. And the picture there is of a is of like a garment, like a coat. Imagine you've got a coat and it's all dirty and there's holes in it and it looks a real state. Uh, and you look at yourself in the mirror, and this is essentially what we do when we come to God's word, isn't it? Uh, it's like looking in a mirror. James talks about looking into the, the perfect law uh, of liberty, and we're looking to God's word, and we see ourselves reflect, and we say, well, that's awful. I need to lay that aside. I need to lay aside that, that take that coat off and put it to one side. Um, what, what's that hymn we sing? Lay aside, lay aside the garment that is stained by sin, like that, because that's really what it's saying. Put it to one side. Uh, don't don't wear that anymore. Uh, because <coughs> why? Because you're a new creature now. That was the old you. Don't don't go into the corner of your your room and pick up that skanky, smelly old you and put it on again and say, well, I guess this is me. No, that lay that aside. Get rid of it. And because you've been uh, you are a new creature or a new creation now in Christ. And uh, this sin is entirely inconsistent with a changed heart, with being a new creature in Christ. Therefore, we have to uh, understand that that is to be, that is to be uh, laid aside. Sin besets us uh, and it entangles us very, very easily, doesn't it? You know, why? Because it was once the central point, the central focus uh, of our lives preached on the other week you know how uh, uh, William Booth says that uh, sin is selfishness it's putting me at the center of my life and therefore because that was so much a part of my old uh, life and the focus of my old life it's very easily entangles again it very easily besets me again particularly if I'm struggling particularly if I'm you know knocked down a little bit I go back to my default position which is sin, you know, that's where I go running for my comfort. And it, it's, it's taking every thought captive and no longer allowing my mind to run down those old paths that it used to do, but saying, no, hang on, something has happened in my life and it is salvation in Christ. Therefore, uh, no, I'm done with that now. I must reckon myself dead to those things. So this sin, this focus of our old lives was strengthened and it was rationalised and it was justified by all sorts of things, by our society, by, by my education, uh, uh, by, by my own natural and corrupt impulses. All these things strengthened sin. 
in my life and I was able to justify it uh, to myself and if we're not careful that can happen again uh, and so these things can entangle us rather like a runner you know running. have you ever seen when they do the kind of um, what is it the hurdles when you've got to run I mean, how do they do that how do they how do you run a race and also hurdle at the same time but anyway they do it but it only takes them to kind of their foot tips one of the hurdles and you see where the hurdle kind of falls over and they get all tangled up in it and then you get about three or four of them all crash to the ground in a, in a big lump and this is what's happening is this this these past ways this past sin and the way that i used to justify myself it entangles me so easily it trips me up so easily that i have to be aware and make sure that nothing is going to tangle me up as i as i run this metaphorical this spiritual uh, race this this you know uh, it must be laid aside and we must live walk and run this this race of faith and um, if we just go back to Hebrews uh, 12 there, I just love the encouragement um, that the writer gives us. He says right at the beginning, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. It's as if he's imagining himself in this race and there is a crowd of people. And all the people in the crowd are David. Gideon, Moses, uh, Ruth, Abel, Samson, Daniel, all these people that he's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. He's sort of, it's like the roll call of faith, isn't it? All these amazing Old Testament saints. And he's saying, imagine them all just, just they're, they're, they're queuing up by the side of the track that you're running down. And what are they doing? They're cheering you on. You know, you see these runners and they come into the stadium like when they've run the marathon, what is it, 26 miles. And you come into the, the stadium and they just want to drop on the ground and that's you're just completely spent. But the people start clapping and cheering and it's like they find their, their second win, don't they? And they make it to the line. And he's saying, this is what, you know, all these Old Testament saints, if they could, and if we could hear them, we'll be saying, come on, you can do it. It's important. You know, it's worth it. And, and so it, it, it's imagining this great uh, cloud of witnesses who've all, you know, done these things. They've wrought righteousness. They've obtained promises. They've subdued kingdoms all through faith. Uh, you know, the world was not worthy of them. Uh, and yet they, they, they've done all this stuff. You know, God is in approval of them and he'll be in approval of you too if you take hold of this, this idea and you endure uh, to the end. So, I guess it's an important question to ask. Is it a foregone conclusion that every runner that sets off running will, will win the race? Are they all going to win? No. no. Are they all going to complete the race? Yeah. Uh, uh, these are rhetorical questions. Um, let, let's just turn to 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians 9. And you'll see how often this kind of language, this sort of imagery is used. Um... And maybe this is why some people attribute uh, the epistle to the Hebrews to the Apostle Paul, because it's similar language here. So 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may be, sorry, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So it's kind of comparing it a bit like to the Olympics in the ancient days. You'd win like a, a crown of laurels, laurel leaves, and they'd like put it on your head. Now that's corruptible. In other words, I don't know, a few weeks or so, the leaves are going to just kind of go all dry and decompose and that's it you've lost it but he's saying we, we've got an incorruptible crown god is going to give us a reward for 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 our race i therefore he says so run not as uncertainly so fight i not as one that beateth the air 
but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Uh, the, the, it's a funny word, isn't it? Castaway makes you think of a desert island. Uh, it's the Greek adokimos. Uh, you can translate it also as rejected or reprobate. So, 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 I'll leave that with you, as they say. Paul is saying, you know, I, I want to run this race in such a way as the one who, who wins the prize. I want to have that attitude in me. So you see, you see these great runners. Oh gosh, I've got to think of one now. These great, like Eric Little, there you go. Christian, uh, you know, Eric Little is so famous because in one race he he he's the favourite to win the race, okay? And he was like I don't know, a hundred meter runner, something like that. He was he was it was short sprint, and so he sets off down this 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 track in this race, and halfway round he, he he trips up or falls over anyway, and everyone's like, oh, that's it, he's out, isn't he? He's, you know, that's it, it's all over. But he gets up. And he starts off running again and he catches everybody up, he overtakes them and he wins the race. Because, why? Because he had the attitude, I'm going to win this race. Now, I'm not interested in what anybody else is doing or what anybody else thinks of me. I am going to cross the line first. And Paul is saying, I have to have that attitude in the Christian life. I can't be a kind of, oh, well, hope I make it to heaven. You know, I think this is the picture, really, the metaphorical language that is being used is I must have the attitude that I am going to win. I'm going to be the first over the line. Therefore, I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to train myself. I'm going to strive. I'm going to keep my eye on the finishing line. What anybody else is doing doesn't matter. My one thing needs to be single minded or to use the words of Jesus. Uh, our eye must be single. We must have that same attitude as that, that that athlete who's competing in the um, in the Olympics so uh, if I'm to finish the race I must not become distracted by other things and you find us as a Christian soft and we get distracted don't we or as it says here uh, uh, entangled with weights uh, uh, beset with sin you know no, I must have a single eye I must keep my eye on the prize. Well, what is my eye to be set on? Again, uh, such great way that it is phrased here in Hebrews 12. I think it's really, uh, really clear, if it wasn't clear to you before. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of of our faith he starts it he's going to finish it i'm not going to i'm not going to start with christ and then finish it on my own okay anyone who teaches that hasn't understood the scriptures i start with christ i finish with christ because without him i can do nothing without the indwelling power of the spirit i can do nothing you know it, it it's it's jesus all the way but I must be looking unto him, the author and finisher of faith. I think this is a reference, although it's kind of a veiled reference, to something that happens in the Old Testament. Let's have a look at it. Numbers chapter 21. Don't often go to Numbers, but we will tonight. Numbers 21 and verse... Seven. We'll just kind of. Time's a bit short. We'll just get straight into it there. Verse seven. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, "We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee." Interesting. So they spoke against the Lord, and they also spoke against Moses, and that was a sin. Uh, pray unto the Lord that He take away the serpents from us. Do you remember how those like? Uh, 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 fiery serpents that bit the people and um, take the, uh, that he will take the serpents away from us and Moses prayed for the people and verse 8 and the Lord said unto Moses make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that has bitten when he looketh upon it 
shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, uh, he lived. So this idea of if you want to live, you have to look up. You had to look to that to that brass image on the pole is a, is a picture. And it's generally accepted that this is the, the idea is that Christ uh, became sin or a sin sacrifice for off for us, and he was raised up on a cross. And if you look to him in faith, you'll be healed of what of sin, of 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 that venomous bite of sin if you like and so that's the picture and so i think this is what the writer to the hebrews is alluding to looking unto jesus looking unto that serpent on the pole that we might be healed uh, uh, of our of our sin it also puts me in mind of uh, philippians uh, 3 these are great verses by the way philippians 3 if you're into underlining in your bible underline these philippians 3 We'll put it in context, verse 12. Paul says, not as though, not as though, so Philippians 3, verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, there's that word again, but I follow after it that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. See the single mindedness again the single eye one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before i press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of god in christ jesus let us therefore as many as be perfect their word again be thus minded and if anything ye be otherwise minded god shall reveal even this unto you so he presses towards the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he forgets what's behind. So many Christians would get much further and grow much quicker in their Christian life if they forgot what was behind and looked to what was before or what was ahead of them. And just, just say, right, well, that's behind me now. I, you know, uh, uh, what's the guy? Eric Little's fall when he fell down. He did not spend the time staring at that patch of ground. So, why, why did I fall? What was, you know, was it a stone? Was it, you know, why did I have to trip? What, what, what a mess I've made of my race. He just got up and got back in the race again. And that's what Christians have to do. They have to just get up and get in the race again and, and, and forget what lies behind, but look to that finishing line again and, 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 and look ahead to it. So, um, and, and if we are, we, we have to see, we have to make sure that we are fit for the race that is ahead of us, uh, that, that we are not pursuing other things other than Christ, uh, uh, that we are not weak in the faith. Uh, and if we are still babes in Christ, then it just depends whether you truly desire and love the truth if you do, then God will reveal. God will reveal. That's what it said, isn't it? The, even this to you. God will reveal to you, not boasting, what I'm teaching you tonight. God will reveal. He will convince you that what I say is true. If you love the truth. And if you desire that, even if you are a babe in Christ, then you'll grow. You will overcome. Uh, and you'll be right in that 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 race and god will convince you that what i'm saying tonight bears scrutiny okay christ is the author and the finisher of my faith he is the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end alpha is the beginning letter of the greek alphabet omega is the very last letter so he's the first and the last the beginning the end the author and finisher of our faith and he's the one who started the work Philippians says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 verse 6. But it also says, only let your conversation be as it becometh 
the gospel of Christ, Philippians 1, 27, same chapter, same context. So, yes, he will do it as long as my life is one that becometh the gospel of Christ. How do I live a life that becometh the gospel of Christ? By yielding to Christ and by allowing him to increase, me to decrease, by making sure that the life I now live, I live not, not I that liveth, but Christ who lives in me. Yeah, and that, that, that he lives through me. So Christ is, is our example. And we'll just finish with this now in Hebrews uh, Hebrews 12. Just quickly back there, 12, verse 2. So looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So should we not also, also for the joy that is set before us, endure the crosses that we have to take up when we deny ourselves and take up our cross? And should we not despise the shame that others may attribute to us and the shameful names they may call us and the things that they, they may despise us with and say about us? Should we not despise that uh, because like our master, we will endure those crosses because of the joy that is set before us, which enables us to to run that race uh, and to win an incorruptible crown.